So let's get started. So I'm just going to go through what we're going to do over the next several weeks. And we're going to start very basic. Um, the first thing is, what is a real number? Now, if you're interested in math at all, math history, you've probably heard this story before. But uh, Pythagoras himself was really gung-ho about rational numbers. He thought everything was counting numbers and also fractions. He thought that everything could be done with fractions. Then he starts working on his triangles, and one of his students finds out that there are numbers that, like, what could be more straightforward than this? You have a tile, say, in a floor that's one by one, and the distance from here to here is not a rational number. The rumor is that that actually caused, like, mayhem. I think the story is that the person that showed this to Pythagoras ended up getting killed because Pythagoras thought it basically destroyed his entire theory. So, uh, so it's very interesting that, um, fractional fractions are a, uh, are not complete in some way because the, the, uh, distance here is, um, square root of two over two, right? One plus one, or is it square root of two? right? Two. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so first I'm going to prove to us, if you've never seen this proof before, that the square root of two is not a rational number. That's just a fun little proof. Um, and then I'm going to have to talk about some concepts about what is missing in the rational numbers? Because one thing to remember about rational numbers is it's just like I described on the other page where no matter how small you make, you make the, uh, the gap here, and then you make it smaller here, and then you blow it up. You make it smaller here, you blow it up. Make it smaller here. No matter how small I make these two fractions, 500001 over... Uh, what, like 10, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 5, 0, 0, 0, 2 over 10, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. You can always put another rational number in here. So the question isn't there's a limit in how small they get, and yet there are gaps because this number is not a rational number. That's, that's what leads to real numbers and calculus and the whole thing. There's something wrong with rational numbers. They're not complete in some way. What does that mean? That's the, that's the subject of calculus. You've probably heard all that before. Um, so, but something that you may not have seen or maybe you have seen is how to actually construct the real numbers. So what are the real numbers? Um, and the, the most typical way of constructing them are with something called Dedekind cuts. So I'm going to show you that and then even more interesting than that is that there's only one set of real numbers. No matter how you, there, there's the, the qualities that make real numbers, there are not two sets that have this quality. If the set has this quality, then it's going to be the same as any other. You're just describing it in different ways. There's only one set of real numbers. So in some way, real numbers are complete. And something that you never see online is the proof that this, that, that uh, real numbers are unique. So I'm going to go through that proof as well. Uh, it's a little bit tedious, but it's always good to practice proving things and diff seeing different ways that things are proved. It'll be good to add it to the internet since it doesn't exist, so we'll do that. So after we've done that, it turns out I just got through saying that the real numbers are complete, but of course they're not because then there are still equations that don't have solutions, even with real numbers. This solution, there's, there's no rational number that squared plus one equals zero. There's no real number squared plus one equals zero. Because if you move this to the other side, you get x squared equals negative one. Nothing times itself is negative. Because even, you know, negative two times negative two. A negative times a negative equals a positive, say it. Negative times a negative is a positive, right? A negative times a negative equals a positive. 
the real numbers are in some way incomplete. We can't, there are polynomials with nothing, polynomials with coefficients that are just integers that we can, can, that we can form that don't have even real solutions. That's what the complex numbers are. So of course, I'm sure you know that the answer to this question is x equals i, which is an imaginary number. And um, that's what leads to the complex numbers. And then finally, we have sort of a complete set of um, numbers that will solve all polynomials. Um, so I'm going to show you the properties of complex numbers. And again, I'm sure that a lot of this should be review, but it's good to get it all out there. Um, and then we'll look at complex functions uh, and some properties of them, which we need to understand in order to get into integration. Um, related to uh, complex functions, um, then, then we have to get into what continuity means. And derivatives, um, if you remember from calculus, uh, the derivative is defined as, um, as uh, the limit. It's defined in a couple of different ways. As um, h equals 0 of f of x minus h. Um, whoops, minus f of x over h. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the plus, and that's a minus. So the limit as h gets 0, as this, as this gets closer and closer to um, 0, this gets closer and closer to 0. That's the... Uh, that's the derivative. And of course, what this is, is the difference in y over the difference in x. In other words, the slope, right? If you have a, if you have a function, it's the slope, the difference in y over the difference in x. So for complex numbers, so complex numbers have um, a real part and an imaginary part. So like this, if this is a this is b, then this is a plus bi. And uh, so for continuity with real numbers, the, con the concept of continuity, the concept of a derivative is just one dimensional. You just need to know that if you have an, a function that it's continuous as you, if you have a, if you have a spot here, as you approach it this way, it's continuous. As you approach it this way, it's continuous. But with complex numbers, first of all, we're talking about a four-dimensional space because we have two dimensions here. But then the function f, if this is z, then the function z takes it to another uh, complex space. So we're talking about four dimensions here, two in the domain, two in the range. And again, I'm not expecting anyone this to sink in in any way. I'm just sort of showing us what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so what's interesting in complex analysis, in order for there to be a derivative, you have to be able to approach from any direction, and you have to get the same answer. So it's possible to have a function that might go blow up one direction if you come at it from one way and blow up another direction if you come at it from the other direction. That's not smooth. There's no derivative at that point. But the functions that we're interested in need to, you need to be able to approach it from any direction. So what that means is that the, the derivative uh, of a function approaching from x has to equal um, so say the, like x, uh, has to equal the same function uh, coming from y. Uh, and that puts a lot of structure on it because you have to imagine if you have a two-dimensional plane and you have some kind of a surface over it, even though remember, it's not actually a surface because it's also two-dimensional, but if you have some kind of a surface over it, it has to be, if this is going to be true, it has to be smooth in every direction. And that's a big constraint on, on what these, on the behavior of these functions. And that's one of the things that leads to this uh, 
complex numbers being such an interesting topic because that additional constraint leads to all sorts of interesting results. So there are these relations, the Cauchy-Riemann relations. And it's basically a way of, of expressing that the derivative as you approach from one direction equals the derivative as you approach from the other direction. If that's true, then the, uh, oh, so you can express a function as the real part as two separate functions, uh, the real part plus the um, imaginary part. So uh, if this is a function of z, you'd have two functions, u of z and v of z. One is goes the real direction, one goes the imaginary direction. So uh, if the function is smooth, then uh, the partial of u with respect to x is gonna equal the partial of v with respect to y and the partial of u with respect to y is gonna equal the, the negative of the derivative of the partial of v with respect to x, okay? These are called the Cauchy-Riemann uh, equations and this is just a way of expressing the fact that the derivative of, uh, if a derivative exists, it has to exist from any direction. No matter how you come at the point, you're gonna to have to come up with the same the same answer. This is a way of expressing that. So this constraint uh, does a lot for the the behavior of these of these functions. So one of the most interesting things, uh, topics is one of the most interesting things in math when you first come across this. Uh, is that e to the i pi equals minus one. And the first time you see that, it blows you away because it's like everything interesting about math is all here together. There's negative numbers, pi, e, negative um, imaginary numbers, and they all work together to equal minus one. e raised to pi equals negative one is really bizarre. And there have been a million explanations online about why this is true, and it's fundamental to complex numbers. So we're going to tackle it also. I'm going to explain uh, why this is true, how it relates to complex numbers, and um, how it comes out of complex numbers in a very, uh, uh, how it comes out of complex numbers. The book that, we're, that I'm gonna be following the most, but not exclusively, is kind of the classic. Uh, it's written by, Lars Alfors, it's called Complex Analysis. And the book is very difficult and very thorough. It's difficult, if there's ever a math book that's difficult, it's difficult because the author is not, is assuming too much. He's making jumps and that just loses you and then you don't know what's going on. What he's doing is almost never actually complicated. It's just that he, jumps around too much, and so you get lost. He does that a lot. But if you can get it, then it's actually quite cool. And one of the coolest things about this book is that he actually doesn't like angles. So one of the conclusions that he comes to in this book is how you can think of an angle, meaning, you know, an angle, not in a geometric sense. And that sort of gets back to this. So that's all very cool. That's one of the things that we'll, that we'll talk about. Uh, then we're going to move on to complex integration. And um, so again, before we can really do complex integration, you're going to need to know um, multivariable calculus. And I think I'm going to put those in a separate, I mean, I know I am. I'm going to put those in a separate series. And I'm going to do that series after we finish the complex integration series. Uh, but know that there will kind of be, uh, you know, I'll have a... Um, I'll have a link to those once they're done. So, but for now, uh, for this series, we're just gonna go ahead, assume everything for that uh, familiarity with, with multivariable calculus. Um, so complex integration is, uh, the question is with complex numbers, what does this mean? So we know that with real numbers, um, if we have, if this is F, and we have, you know, from A to B, all we're doing is taking the value of F 
at every place along from when x is from a to b and summing them up. And I want to say something right now that the way that we learned about calculus in high school was that you're summing up these little, the uh, area of these little rectangles and then you're making them smaller and smaller until you total them. I don't like that definition for reasons that I'll talk about more, but all we're really doing is summing up the actual value of these, um, of the function at each one of those points, at every point. So um, there's an infinite number of them, you sum them up, and then what's the, what's the answer that you get? That's what it is in uh, one-dimensional calculus, in real calculus. So the question is, what does this equal? And uh, so again, getting back to getting back to the derivative and how you can come at it in any direction in the complex plane. So if this is real and this is um, imaginary, with real calculus, you just go from A to B, just one direction. But here, if you're calculating from A to B, if you're trying to get the, uh, the, um, the integral, sum up the values from A to B, you can go any infinite number of ways. So what does this mean? You actually have to do it, you have to specify the line, which, which route you're taking. That's how this is like multivariable calculus. So the definition of um, this is if you imagine that Z is uh, parameterized, then um, F of Z equals uh, F of Z of T times the derivative of Z times DT. Now, this is now actually um, in, uh, this is just a real valued um, integral, right? T from, say, T equals A to T equals B, okay? So, uh, we'll be going through that, and then what you end up with, the other thing that's used a lot um, is uh, you'll see this equation a lot, which we'll, which we'll get to, that um, f of z dz equals um, the integral of u uh, derivative of x. Actually, let me write it this way. Uh, u dx minus v dy plus i integral um, v dx plus u dy. Uh, yeah. So this sort of separates the real from the imaginary. And, or, yeah, from the imaginary. So um, we'll get to that and what that means and how you get there. Uh, but you can kind of use both of those, um, both of those ways at different times. So uh, now, if you do know multivariable calculus, one interesting question is, what is this? Because line integrals are something that you learn in multivariable calculus. If you take an integral from here to there, a to b, and if this is a, if, if this is a vector field, then the integral of that is f dot dr, is f dot dr, okay? This is not f dot dr. Because f dot dr, you end up with, just using the dot product, you end up with basically uh, p dx plus q dy. That is the vector field in this direction uh, times um, the changes in, in the x direction plus the field in that direction plus the changes in that direction. Uh, this is just the dot product. This is not the dot product. It's something more complicated than that. And uh, so we'll be talking about that too. What it actually is, is this is just complex. This is really complex multiplication rather than the dot product. So it's a different animal, which is also very interesting and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Um, so we'll look into that some more. It's too bad she won't live. <laughs>
But then again, who does? Okay, here is the link to the first video in this chapter. Here is the link to the previous video. Here is the link to the next video. And click here to subscribe, and please join me on Patreon. The link to that is below in the description. Thank you.